assistant debate coach at the University of Michigan, Kevin Hearn. All right. Um, I'm pretty excited for this topic. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Who here has taken AP or IB economics? Okay, who here has taken an economics class? A few of you. Um, that'll be a huge advantage on this topic. Um, I have a prediction that you're probably going to hear a lot of the same definitions and concepts um, over the next uh, couple of days, uh, a couple of months, really. Um, actually, I'm just going to uh, reset this really quick. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me fine? Um, and that is because this is a complicated topic. Uh, so we're just going to get right into it. Um, this is the basic plan for what I want to talk about. Uh, we only have a couple of hours. And to be honest, I feel like there is so much content in this resolution that, especially if there are any questions, this is the kind of thing where any given sub area could go on for you know, hours. Um, but I do want to cover everything here because I think it's really important to set the stage for at least how I understand the resolution so far. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit more background than I did when we set this up last year. Um, and that's because, you know, kind of previewing it, and uh, it's out in the starter pack if you've already taken a look, the two core definitions we have of fiscal redistribution, the core term of the resolution, are one about progressivity and one about taxes. And to even understand what those mean, to be honest, there's a lot of backstory and complicated work behind it. And it's kind of annoying that unlike last year where security cooperation, we were dealing with a term that's been used over and over and over again by Congress. It's used in the media. Pretty much everybody who talks about fiscal redistribution is writing for a academic audience, they are not in government, and they're part of like a very small clique of like mainly European and four American economists. Um, and you know, they immediately get into very, very arcane diatribes about how to complicate, you know, um, a derivative uh, given a certain slope. And it gets really arcane. And so it's not the easiest stuff to get into. Um, and so we're gonna go through all of the core things you need to um, get through that. So fiscal policy in the United States, what is it? What are we trying to redistribute? Uh, put simply, fiscal policy refers to a country's entire budget. Ultimately, you get money, which is typically via taxation, although there are other means. You can tariff, which might be different. Uh, you can borrow it, which is a very common way. You can do all kinds of things to get money, but typically it's taxes. And you then have to spend it on something. And when we say fiscal policy, we're generally referring to the use of funds in order to effectuate an economic outcome. Um, but really, the whole budget allotted by the legislature is going to count as fiscal policy. Um, this is usually juxtaposed with monetary policy, um, which is usually seen as like it's paired opposite. Uh, monetary policy refers to actions that the central bank or the currency issuer of a state takes. And specifically, the central bank in the US is the Federal Reserve, which has twin objectives of minimizing inflation and minimizing unemployment. Uh, so price stability and maximum employment are what they try to do. And they typically. Uh, issue the currency formally. They are the ones who set uh, various economic rates that determine what interest rates are. They are the ones who basically determine if we're going to print money. Um, you know, they're the people who have the ultimate say so. Um, but it's the people setting the budget that are fiscal policy. So we're kind of more concerned with fiscal policy, but monetary policy will come up again and again and again. You've probably noticed that the interest rates DA put out by this camp already is 
basically about monetary policy's reaction to fiscal policy. And we're actually at an opportune time for that dis-ad because uh, that's a very major issue. So uh, fiscal policy in the US, what do we spend it on? Um, here's a basic view of both what we spend it on and where it comes from. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the uh, core parts of our budget are what the topic's about. Um, Social Security, clearly in the topic. Medicare, we'll get there. Um, and then we'll kind of go into what these mandatory and discretionary programs mean. If either of the other two parts of the resolution were to get enacted, they would take a pretty sizable chunk of this. They wouldn't just be listed anonymously. They would get their own component of federal spending. And so it's kind of fun that, unlike most debate topics, when you are reading an AF or pretty least an AF, you're actually going to get to deal with a huge amount of funding, likely in the billions upon billions. So uh, as we see it divided here, we have these two terms, discretionary versus mandatory. Um, these are just important to know, and they come up again and again. Um, we'll start with mandatory. Uh, mandatory spending is that which is authorized by a permanent law. So Congress doesn't have to go through a whole uh, hullabaloo and pass a continuing resolution in which they bargain over the specifics to fund Social Security. It's automatically funded year after year after year. Uh, and so these are often called entitlements because we say a set amount of people who meet this category, as long as they're eligible, whatever it costs, we are going to spend the money that we've projected out for them. So mandatory spending or entitlements are a huge part of our budget. Uh, for the Social Security part of this topic, the major controversy is ultimately about uh, is this entitlement, which you already saw was literally the biggest individual part of our uh, entire fiscal outlay. It's you know bigger than the military by almost twice. Uh, is it getting a little bit out of control? Uh, should we use something about it? Um, there are other major mandatory uh, spending items. The other big entitlement program we have in the US is Medicare. Um, and Medicaid and the rest are kind of complicated. There is a case that Medicaid's part of the topic. I don't think it's a very good one. Um, but I would be surprised if we didn't see some of the apps this year. And, and to be totally honest, the, the evidence is better than I would like it to be. Um, so you might have to know about that. It's hard to know exactly. But this covers the general range of major entitlement programs. The majority of programs by name, like if you were going to list out the you know, number of different programs we have, are not entitlement programs. But by volume, in terms of like the programs we spend money on, the majority are entitlement programs. Uh, discretionary spending is the part of the budget that has to work through the appropriation process every year. And it is kind of a depressing fact of contemporary political life that this is basically the thing Congress does. Or like if they're going to do two things in a year, this will be one of the things. It'll be a major fight over how exactly we can uh, pass or maybe even formally put off having to pass a uh, budget. And the majority of programs, the majority of funding for individual agencies uh, is going to be discretionary and thus uh, voted on every year. Here are some of the major players in this year's topic. Uh, the Department of Education, which comes up in some proposals for job training um, for a job guarantee. Uh, Health and Human Services, which uh, administers both Medicare and Medicaid, ultimately, through the CMM. Um, HUD, which, again, uh, there's some um, proposals for. Uh, and then, of course, the big one, the Social Security Administration, which you'll notice is not in, under an agency. It's its own thing, like the EPA. OK, so that's just background. But you do need to know these. Um, and eventually, when you start getting into, are these types of programs regressive or progressive, you'll have to know what they are in order to move forward. So we're kind of building a foundation. Um, the next part of that is. For either of these types of programs, many of them can be categorized into one of these two binaries, universal versus means-tested, and 
cash benefits versus in-kind benefits. So when we say the word benefits here, this, like the term transfers, is really just a synonym for all of the stuff we spend. Ultimately, as long as that money is going to somebody, and it typically is, we can call that a transfer or a benefit. Uh, so when we go through all of these, the recipients of the healthcare for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, the recipients of food stamps for uh, SNAP, the recipients of tax credits for the EITC, all of those people are getting a benefit that's transferred to them. And uh, basically the important part is they can be either a cash benefit, which is typically when you have no restrictions on them, like if you get a tax credit, it just goes into your bank account once you cash the return. If you get a social security check, it is literally that, a check. Um, whereas others are in kind. And that can range from something like food stamps, which if you've ever seen a store that says, you know, we accept EBT, that's what they're talking about. You know, it's almost like cash. It's like a credit card that you can use at certain stores, so it's close, but not quite. All the way to something like healthcare or job training, which has a cash value, like the health insurer would bill you a certain amount. Um, the, you know, whatever education you get, they're gonna send you a bill, but you're not getting cash. And so whatever you're getting from the government can be categorized as cash or in kind. It can also, based on the program, be categorized as universal versus means tested. Means tested basically means that you go through a process of income verification that comes with the process of filling out your taxes. So based off of this guideline, uh, which is um, published every year uh, to account for inflation, where your income falls determines what you might lie on within the federal poverty line. And a lot of programs are means tested, and we'll see a few examples here. So um, just because a lot of these come up over and over again in FR literature, and quite a few of them are gonna sneak their way into the topic, uh, I wanted to at least have a basic foundation for the social programs we're talking about here uh, when we're talking about benefits. Uh, you'll see Medicaid, uh, CHIP, it basically every one of these programs except for Medicare and Social Security and at, depending on the state, unemployment insurance is means tested. And so for Medicaid, for example, in most states that means if your income is 170% of whatever this is appropriately for your household, if you live in a house of four people and your household gross income is 37,000, uh, you would be just under the 170% of that threshold and you would therefore qualify for Medicaid. Nearly every one of these has a different threshold. Some of them get preposterous. The child tax credit, uh, which some people call a basic income, uh, was this year, for example, kind of in the news because they had a range of eligible recipients. And the range went from all the way to the top, it's something like, uh, 160K a year uh, to at the bottom $250. So if you made $250 or less as a household, you were not eligible for this tax credit, which actually excluded like 36,000 people who obviously needed this more than anybody else. Um, which I, there's like a lot of you know speculation about this. Some people might actually think that it was kind of like a mistake. Um, but there are some people who actually defend it as well. There's allegedly some economic reason for it. But the point is how you mean test really determines uh, the process. And one of the big themes in uh, the advocates for the app on this topic is that the process is very arduous. It's a little bit cumbersome. I mean, me personally, I mean, this is probably not something an adult should do. Uh, I've forgotten to file taxes multiple years. It's not uh, impossible. Um, and so, Altogether, it's like a very difficult process. Uh, the EITC this year, I think, has something like 40% uh, of people that are eligible for it actually receiving benefits, which is, I guess, the whole concept. 
Um, I think sometimes people means test things in order to prevent people from getting enrolled. Um, but the advocates for job guarantee for uh, basic income and the people who defend Social Security and want to expand it are like, you don't have to do any of this. You just get it. That's the whole fun. Um, and it's also going to be uh, an important counter plan uh, against it as well. So that concludes the first kind of journey through fiscal background. It's uh, the most, you know, survey-ish. This one will get a little bit deeper into concepts, uh, although I think this one is kind of clear enough as well. Um, so the second is inequality. Uh, so remember, there's kind of like a general theme here. We're trying to learn what we need to in order to figure out what it means to say that fiscal redistribution requires a tax and that it requires progressive redistribution. So the meaning of progressive is bundled up in this idea of inequality. Uh, so first we're going to just analyze the state of contemporary inequality in the United States. Um, and the first step is defining it, which is just how evenly income or wealth is divided across the population. Um, it is about the distribution overall of the entire population. So it's not like I have a group here, I have a group there, and I'm comparing them. Typically, when we measure this, we're trying to assess it relative to the whole. And we're trying to see how regular the distribution is. Um, there is a pretty major distinction, and uh, this will come up in lots of cards, uh, and it'll come up in debates as well, between wealth and income inequality. Uh, it's pretty intuitive. Income is what you receive every year uh, as a salary, as a result of investments, as a gift, whatever. Income is stuff that you get every year that you didn't have before. Wealth is what you're already sitting on. And so somebody who's so rich that they don't need to have a job and don't has zero income and actually qualifies well, they don't qualify for the child tax credit, but they, they would qualify potentially for everything else. A lot of these have carve outs that would prevent um, this, but a lot of them don't, straight up, because most of these are measured off of annual income. Now, uh, the reason why most of them would not is because uh, savings from like, uh, you know, the interest from savings accounts will count as income. And so if you're that rich, you'd probably get savings. But maybe you just keep all the cash in your bank. Maybe you don't actually formally get it uh, in any way that's measurable. You're rich. Doesn't matter. You qualify. Uh, and it's also important to note that even if income is about the same, if some people have much more wealth than others, that doesn't really mean you have an equal society. Um, wealth is a lot harder to deal with, though, um, for reasons we'll get to. But I mean, it's much easier to hide. It's much easier to um, politically insulate yourself from uh, having it taxed. And it's generally harder to measure as a result of the uh, lack of data surrounding it. Um, I think that covers the definitions. Uh, so we're just going to go through a few graphs really quick, um, just to kind of do a uh, brief history. There, there are some people who disagree with these measurements. We always love to have contrarians. But I tried to go with mainly census data that seemed as close to universally accepted as possible. Uh, we'll start with uh, median household income. Um, as you'll notice, it's gone up uh, to an extent, but it's tapered. And we're really not any farther up in uh, 2016 than we were in 1998. Um, and this measurement, by the way, real, just means it takes into account inflation. And so in real terms, it would be a little bit higher. But in uh, meaningful terms, it's about the same. So for this period of about 20 years and uh, Afterwards, we actually went a little bit higher. COVID went way down, and we're now pretty much in the same spot. Since the mid-90s, the median household in the United States, the one that 50% of households have more income than and 50% have less than, has not really improved their annual take-home income, which is not the case, say, from 
1998 to uh, any time prior, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. It was a pretty steady rise up until then. Uh, you'll see the same thing with real wages, except even worse, it's kind of shrinking a little bit. And so this just refers to the average wage uh, for, um, I believe it's the lower, I think this is only for the lowest um, quartile of people in the US. Um, the bottom 90% have seen a little increase. If you take it all the way back to 1973, it looks pretty good. Um, and if you measure inequality, which I'm spoiling a little bit because we'll get to how to do this formally uh, soon, inequality has also risen precipitously. Uh, so I think I'm just going to go over the main theories for where inequality comes from. Um, the general thesis that it exists, uh, it's measurable by wealth, it's measurable by income, it exists for basically um, wages, uh, household income, and almost every measurable, uh, and it's increasing, is, is generally accepted. Uh, there's a wide range of forces that drive it. Um, so, of course, there's like some basic stuff, like personal choices, no society's ever been equal. Um, some people will get different educations, put in effort. But there's usually like a big four or five that uh, shaped the US in the last 40 or 50 years that I want to get into. Um, and this is pretty standard stuff. Um, some people might disagree with some of these. But from the 40s to the 1970s, the United States was about as um, willing to confront inequality as a major power ever seems to have been. Uh, and so there was an increase in unions, there was an increase in average wealth, uh, there was a decrease in inequality, and uh, this coincided with um, the post-war baby boom. Now, it's kind of cheating because if you think about what happened in 1945, we have almost every country in the world blown to smithereens in a terrible war. And then we have the victor, America, which, you know, other than Pearl Harbor, does not face any direct damage and basically gets to make all of the economic deals at the end of it, including some pretty sweet ones that basically establish the dollar as the functional global currency via the Bretton Woods Accords. The US is in a good position to make a killing, and we do. And we redistribute a lot of that to uh, the people of the US. And so this is a time where you don't need a high school education, uh, and you could work in a factory, get a union job with benefits, and easily afford to send your kids to college and buy a house. Um, that's obviously a little bit of like a, a shiny, um, you know, kind of a telling a nice story about it, but it's, it's somewhat the truth as well. Um, so what happened between now and then that has uh, gotten us off the path? Well, um, competition for limited jobs is one of the major ones. So that competition comes from immigrants. Uh, we have much more high school immigration now than we did previously. That comes from market forces. Uh, technology is always changing, and uh, a lot of the jobs that I was just describing were made obsolete through you know, uh, new technological innovations that meant repetitive, unskilled manual labor was no longer quite as in demand. Um, competition for labor, a big one here is that you these days don't really need to be in the same place as your work. And so a lot of high skilled work has clustered together in very few places that are expensive to live and hard to get to. And then of course we have government policy, uh, which is what fiscal redistribution scholars want to measure most of all. Uh, this period also coincided with a gradual decrease in the Progress, progressivity of taxes. We taxed the rich less, and we gave less generous transfers to individuals. Um, so I've been using these terms uh, you know, for a few minutes now, but I want to define them. OK, so uh, we'll start with regressive. Um, 
if the percentage of your income that you're paid in taxes decreases as your income rises, you are paying a regressive tax. Uh, just to you can kind of codify these with examples, it's always easy to think of this in terms of like a sales tax. And the reason that's true is because uh, think about how much money a rich person has and think about much, how much money a poor person has. Uh, if a rich person is paying a few dollars in sales tax, what is that to them? It's very little. What is that to the poor person? It might be quite a bit. It certainly means more because they have less of it, but they're paying the same amount. And so if you're paying the same rate tax on something, because that tax is going to take a bigger percentage out of somebody with less money's account, it's going to be characterized as regressive, which is the impact of this tax is that it makes income less equal. Before the poorer person paid that sales tax, they were a little bit closer in average percentage income to the richer person. Now, having had a comparatively bigger chunk of their income taken out, they're a little bit uh, farther away. Uh, social security is a huge one. And in this part of the topic, this is probably one of the most salient controversies. Um, the biggest individual tax contributor to social security, something that you'll see on every paycheck you get uh, when you're an adult, is that you contribute six and some change uh, percentage to, of every check before you, uh, you know, cash it or anything. It just comes right out. You contribute that to Social Security. So, you know, on your first dollar, your second dollar, your third dollar, all the way up until your 137,000th dollar a year. After 137K a year, you no longer get taxed and you no longer put in payroll tax on, so on Social Security. So, if you make a lot of money, you actually no longer have to pay the 7% taken out of every check that everybody else always has. So, that's a, a classic example of a regressive tax. Uh, it literally only uh, benefits people who already have more. Um, progressive, it's a surprise, it's the opposite. Uh, progressive tax would be one that increases your percentage of uh, overall income relative to the field as you pay. Uh, you will get to know this uh, very soon if you don't already. Most tax brackets are very progressive. Somebody who has a lower tax bracket might pay 15, 20, 25% in income tax. In a higher bracket, it would be something along the lines of 45. Some of the graphs we'll go to in a little bit. I put a lot of graphs on here. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do every single one of them. Um, although, you know, it's really flavor of the topic kind of thing. Um, a lot of them will show the amount of uh, progressivity has gone down. The amount that people used to pay in income taxes is kind of staggering, considering how it's talked about now. Um, so this is uh, how most taxes work. Uh, in a state tax, it's just one that happens when you die. Um, you pass on to next of kin um, your holdings. And so for the most part, if you have something to pass on, you are necessarily uh, giving somebody something that is not, uh, you know, that it, it just theirs. It's, it's a kind of special privilege or benefit. And so it only benefits um, people who have something. Now, and estate taxes, they don't kick in until it's like uh, six figures or, or well above that. Um, so uh, we're going to go over a few other taxes um, because this is a major component of how we're going to fund our programs and how we're going to change the world through plans. Um, the individual income tax we have in the US is progressive, especially due to its refundability. Um, so refundability means that if the amount of tax the government owes you at the end of the year is in the positives for you and the negatives for them, like let's say you have to pay 20,000 in tax and they have a tax credit for you that's 40K, they write you a check for $40,000. Uh, that is a refundable tax credit. Um, a non-refundable tax credit is one where uh, you're out of luck. Uh, you only get the 20K, they're not gonna give you anything extra. Um, the 
reason why our income tax is progressive is because for lower quadrant earners, you pretty much exclusively get refunds. And so the reason why it didn't really matter and I was only screwing myself when I forgot to pay taxes was that my income was such that paying taxes only helps me. I pay taxes when I put in my payroll tax every week and you actually get a refund if you file for a return. Uh, and so the government actually wants you to not pay in that uh, situation because they are saving themselves from writing a check to you. So uh, the way the income tax system is structured is very progressive. Um, you can see here the number is exactly. So for the people who are in the 0 to 20th percentile uh, in terms of their income relative to everybody else, uh, they generally get between 8 and 10 percent of whatever they pay in taxes back. And for the next 20 to 40 percent, it's close to evening out. Uh, and then if you get to the top 1 percent, they're losing a quarter out of every dollar. And so this is an income tax system that clearly, if we're just looking at the outcome of paying it, uh, it helps those at the bottom become relatively more equal to those at the top relative to the converse. Um, corporate and estate taxes are similarly progressive. Uh, excise taxes are generally regressive. Um, an excise tax is basically a type. It's similar to like a sin tax, um, and it can be. But an excise tax is just any point of sale that you levy an additional fee on an item. Um, you know, you say you have to add six cents to every time you sell that bottle of water. You uh, you have to add ten cents to that pack of cigarettes or whatever. That's an excise tax. And generally speaking, they go to items that poor people use more and that they buy more of, and so they're aggressive. Um, I know this might not be the most fascinating way to start the topic, but to be totally honest, if you get most of this and can define and use these terms well, like the world is going to be your oyster this year, um, and the winds are going to come easily. Uh, you got to work hard, and you will be rewarded. So um, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, I do want to go through this graph um, relatively uh, briefly uh, just to show uh, the percentage change in time. Um, I believe oh, the font's kind of weird. Uh, oh, no, it is there. Sorry. Um, it's, it's supposed to say on all of them, not just the one here, but whatever. Um, these are all the same time range, the 50-year period between 1961 and 2011. Um, so for the bottom 50%, the average amount they paid in just total taxes out of their income was 50 years ago, 18.1%. Uh, Today, it is 23.5%. On the other hand, the people who paid 44% are now paying 32% at the top 1%. Um, and so this is worth keeping in mind, given that, uh, you know, I tried to portray 1961 as a little bit of a banner year for the American enterprise. Um, I mean, you know, it wasn't perfect. We just lost the first leg of the space race to Russia. But generally speaking, we were doing pretty well. And I think geopolitically, we assess our situation is relatively more ahead of our peers than we are today. And you can look what people were paying. It was a lot more. Um, and you can look at what people in the bottom 90% were paying. It was significantly less. Uh, and so keeping that historical record in mind is worthwhile uh, whenever you read somebody uh, attempting to assess the danger or credibility of a relatively novel change, or a relatively um, unnovel change in historical terms and paint it as something crazy. Um, yeah, we're making the same point over and over again, but just kind of put uh, in a slightly different measure uh, the total tax paid um, is lower in 2018 than it was in uh, 1961, and that's a relatively recent change. Uh, we're actually making steady progress up to the last 10 to 15 years. Um, 
Now, we're going to start trying to map this on to taxes and transfers. There are obviously lots of causes of inequality. The reason why I gave that whole little presentation here of causes of inequality was to demonstrate that you know, it's not like this is the only thing in the world that affects it. Um, but it is the most direct tool we have to affect it because the whole point of taxing and then transferring money somewhere else is that you can literally alter by fiat the material distribution of wealth. And so it's the most convenient tool we have, and given that we use it, it's nice to see how it's affected things in the past. Um, so in 2014, uh, which is the last time I could find this, I looked way too long um, for this exact graph. I guess I could have made it myself with some data, but uh, CBO used to publish this every year, uh, S SMH. Um, but basically, they have uh, a comparison of income before transfers and taxes and after transfers and taxes. So what that means is, and this is going to be important because when we assess this for the resolution, for a plan, this is kind of the time frame we're working with. Uh, there are, it's possible that people disagree with me here, um, but I, this is how I read it, and I, I feel pretty confident. Uh, when we say income before taxes, we are basically thinking on an annual time frame. So uh, taxes you pay every year in April, uh, and benefits you typically get from the federal government either in a tax form, if they're a tax return or whatever, every year, or you get them on a biweekly or monthly schedule, and so you'd add up your annual benefits, and you'd compare what was the net redistributive change over that year based only off of A, the taxes, and B, whatever transfers the governments gave to you. Now, this can get a little bit tricky, because remember, uh, when we have to Oh, I'm not going to do all of that. Uh, that thing killed me. Um, but remember the whole list we had of um, you know, programs? A lot of those programs are hard to measure offhand. They might not come with like a cash value listed. Uh, but we try our best. Um, and we uh, assess the overall value. And it's actually not that hard, because for the most part, these are all plotted in budgets and have an exact dollar amount anyways. Uh, the highest quintile of people lose a decent amount, but uh, it's not a huge gain for really anybody, and it's not even a gain at all for the middle quintile, which basically means that 60% of the population is a net loser in the tax and transfer system. They're, they're losing money that they'd otherwise have uh, after the whole sum total of this, and it's all for a relatively small percentage change, even relative to the past. Um, in 2018, uh, we see income before transfers and taxes added to means tested transfers for all the quartiles. Uh, this, I think, attempts to um, assess if means-tested transfers is an independent variable, it doesn't really change things very much, which is something you'll often see. It's mainly because when you directly alter the amount of money somebody has, uh, you can kind of rely on that to be the amount. But basically, we've made very little progress. Um, here's uh, the last graph before we move on to some definitions, uh, which is the average effective tax rate by income percentile. Um, and if you remember those percentages we were looking at before, they used to be quite a bit. But it is very, very, very low towards the bottom. But it's not negative. Um, and uh, this rate takes into account sales taxes, excise taxes, all the different taxes you pay. It's not just income tax. Otherwise, it would be uh, negative for those two for sure. Um, so overall, the top 1% uh, pays pretty similarly to the top quintile overall, um, which given the staggering difference in wealth, some people have a problem with. Um, and it's somewhat progressive from there on out. OK, so why is this important? Well, uh, this is my pick for if I was going to have one fiscal redistribution definition card. 
um, that uh, I can run with for a variety of purposes on the F and the neg. Um, so this card uh, uses a lot of the same language and citations that we're going to be seeing. The people who use the term fiscal redistribution that have something called the fiscal redistribution database, they're a pretty small cadre. Um, they uh, use this term over and over again, the difference between pre-FISC and post-FISC income inequality. FISC, in this case, just means the annual cycle of taxes and transfers. So when you see FISC there, you just kind of insert tax and transfers. Uh, they explicitly say that elsewhere. Um, and they say that we focus on the full set of fiscal effects. And so the inequality measure used here is the Gini coefficient, which we're going to get to next. Um, so there's a specific way we can measure the distribution of inequality. But we measure, quite literally, if the net effect of the transfer has made the society more or less equal uh, in terms of income. Um, so some other things that this card uh, does. Uh, number one, it establishes that fiscal redistribution is progressive. Now that doesn't speak for itself. Um, I mean, redistribution definitely has that connotation, and it's usually used that way. But when I saw the resolution, I was like, it doesn't say fiscally redistribute towards poorer people. Like, what if you had a perfectly equal society? Wouldn't fiscal redistribution, in that case, be redistributing such that things were not equal? OK, then what if you have, like every society in the world, a uh, society somewhere in the middle between perfectly equal and perfectly not equal? Couldn't you move to either side? And I mean, in terms of the apps that would open up for you, I mean, means test social security, which would be uh, the exact opposite of every advocate on the topic and most dissed links, and would be a huge F with lots of advocates. Uh, that's immediately where you'd go. Uh, a basic income guarantee that basically ends every single one of those means-tested programs we listed elsewhere, which, by the way, is a very commonly proposed uh, plan. It's actually the origin of the basic income guarantee. Um, the basic setup here is that I think this clearly says income redistribution has to be progressive in that it has to cause less inequality rather than more. So I like that. Uh, and I would leverage that against interpretations that don't say that if you're um, defending this card against it. I would basically want to make sure that that's included in any definition that I have. Um, the second thing I want to point out is that this is still an exclusive definition. Now, when this says something like, oh, it's every fiscal measure, blah, 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 eh, remember what I started with, what's fiscal policy, the whole budget? That can seem a little bit scary. But no, when we say fiscal policy here, you're talking about the direct government transfers to you. So it doesn't matter what transfer it is. It could have been a Head Start Early Childhood Education Program. It could have been an Earned Income Tax Credit. It could have been whatever it was. Um, but it has to be a direct transfer to you. And we know that because this sets aside broader, non-fiscally redistributed measures, such as labor laws, human bondage. Um, I guess it's, I actually don't even know what it's referring to there. Um, laws setting, I think it, I, oh, I think it means prison. Um, I'm serious, yeah. Uh, there's like a whole section about it. Uh, laws governing business competition, which uh, if you ever see that phrase, uh, that's just uh, antitrust, which was a college topic a couple years ago. So you always want to exclude that because lots of cars floating around. Um, and policies favoring certain output sectors, which are, are basically regulations. So most things that aren't literally just transferring direct cash uh, would be excluded from this interpretation, and I like that as well. Um, I also like that it explicitly includes in-kind benefits. I thought this would be more of a thing than I really think it can be. There's like a couple of cards. But there are some people who say, and there's, uh, the reason they say this is because they're lazy, and it's way easier to have a study that measures just the cash benefits um, it's easier data to acquire, it's less data to acquire. And so a lot of times you'll find studies that are like, for this study, I only use cash benefits for my 
interpretation of fiscal redistribution. Um, and so uh, most of the apps on this topic don't give in kind, uh, but some could. I mean, the two obvious ones, a job guarantee uh, would probably like to do job training and uh, related efforts if it wants to solve career ladders and uh, obviously the healthcare stuff if you're in content and social security, which we'll eventually get to. Um, so I like that it does all of those things together and it also uses uh, basically the only two data sets outside of theirs. So I'm gonna talk about these. Um, it tries to integrate the CEQ project, which uh, this name Lustig, you'll see over and over and over again, and also the only American project, which is called Dyna. Uh, basically, he was like, I integrated all of your stuff into my data so uh, sources, which, to be honest, is like very, very, very hard work. It's like transferring units, seeing what lines up. It's like really, really annoying. And his database is not just any database. It is the one that you see referenced over and over and over again whenever you see somebody try to define fiscal redistribution. Part of this is because it is the only data set or institution that I can find that's continuously publishing that actually has fiscal redistribution, redistribution in the name. And so we can assess pretty uh, confidently that uh, they know what they're talking about and perhaps have a little bit of a monopoly on this information. The Widen Budget Incidence Fiscal Redistribution Database is based off of the Luxembourg Income Study. Uh, do not worry, as I first did, the Luxembourg Income Study is not just a study of Luxembourg, which you know has about 40,000 people. This is a country that, for Luxembourg Day every year, everybody in the country is invited to go into the castle. Um, so it's you know, not maybe the most uh, replicable sample set. Uh, it's a study that was sponsored by the Prince of Luxembourg and basically took uh, 47 countries from around the world, typically developed countries and uh, uh, middle powers, countries like um, uh, Mexico and India are usually cited as like the median countries uh, when ranked by income inequality and uh, GDP per capita. Um, so basically, uh, it includes almost every OECD country, which are like the major European ones, US, Canada. Uh, and they harmonized all of them so that if you're going to study fiscal redistribution, you don't have to do all the legwork of getting all of this data matching. I mean, think about all the stuff you have to know in order to quantify this. You have to know the net expenditures and transfers of like every household in every country ever. It's a lot of data. Uh, all these people speak different languages. You know, it's like a, a lot of work to kind of put this all together. And so there's just not a lot of other things out there. And if you have access to this to play with it, you basically have the ability to more quickly do studies than anybody else. Now, does that give these people unique permission to interpret this phrase? I mean, yes, clearly, but no, um, not exactly, but it's unclear who would have more or greater authority or who would be a more predictable source. I don't know if you've tried this, like uh, the first thing I always do with topics, just because I'm like very basic, I go to dictionaries, I go to Black's Law Dictionary, like just like law sources, um, the first ones on Google. FR, not always there, so I like having at least something authoritative. Okay, um, now the, Elephant in the room here is this term. Uh, the well, Americans typically say Gini uh, coefficient. Uh, British say Gini coefficient. Um, I like Gini better, but you know, uh, do do you? And if anybody tells you you're wrong, uh, they're wrong because it's subjectively said either way. Um, the Gini coefficient is the most basic way to analyze whether or not. Uh, there is more or less income inequality. Uh, all right, so stay with me here. Um, we're actually gonna start maybe, no, let's see right here, okay. So um, this line here going through the middle is a line of perfect inequality. So on this axis, we have all percentiles of uh, income and on this line, we have the population sorted 
uh, in quartile, you know, in the same kind of range. So if 50% of the population had 50% of the wealth, we would literally have a perfect horizontal line here. And as a result, we'd say uh, we have perfect equality. Now, the way Gini measures is by comparing uh, two, different, um, two different sets. So uh, this slope here represents an imperfect set. Uh, so if we have a relatively normally distributed set of income where you know, some people have more than others in an equal line, we'd have this slope at the end. And so we'd say the difference between that slope and perfect equality is measured in the area of this shape here. Okay, And so as a result, this blue line trying to measure um, the area based off of uh, how many people are down here, this blue line is uh, the either going to go from here to here. And here it's zero, it's here it's one, um, and anywhere in between, it's between zero and point 0.1 and expressed as a decimal accordingly. So the Gini coefficient is measured between zero and one. Uh, to actually calculate it is uh, basically requires a calculus that is a little bit beyond my means, um, but that's the general gist of it. And to be honest, you kind of just need to get the concept more than you need to know the specifics, at least I hope. Um, and the Gini coefficient uh, here, basically, uh, this show, I'm actually not sure what that quintile thing shows. Um, but this is what I wanted to show uh, earlier. Um, this shows uh, distribution from uh, perfect equality to, say, uh, the actual income distribution of a country. And again, I think these axes are a little bit more clearly labeled. Here we have the cumulative share of income earned, and here we have the cumulative share of uh, individuals. So what this is saying here is that you take 10% of the people, the 10% of the people who have the least income, what percentage of the income do they have? Here it's 10%. You take the 20% of the people with the least income, what percentage of the income do they have here? 20%. Now, what if the 20% of people had zero? they'd be right here. And so you can only go from here to here as you're going through the poorest people in a country to the richest people in a country. Uh, and what we're measuring when we measure a progressive redistribution is have the people who have less expanded on the graph, have they gotten more money and kind of pushed their way uh, are, are, have they gotten um, less money? Have they you know, pushed their way farther down? Or have they gotten more and stayed closer to the line of perfect inequality? And the shape will be bigger uh, if you have more, uh, if the rich have more money and the poor have less. And so that's how we get from zero to one. I know it's kind of a lot of rambling, but hopefully uh, this graph sold it for you a little bit. Um, now, the annoying thing is, the thing I don't like about this interpretation and what people are going to say, uh, and it's, it's fair, is that it mixes burdens to an extent, uh, at least insofar as, I don't know about you, but I don't have like a handy you know, Wolfram Alpha uh, calculator that can enter all the variables that I don't even have, so I don't have access to this database, for a plan and calculate its effect on uh, the inequality of a country. And so it basically, I don't know if mixes burdens is the right word to use a courtroom term. It calls for speculation, um, at least in terms of the likely progressivity of any given uh, tax or transfer. But on the flip side, what we're going to do is give up on progressivity, be like, oh, well, we can't know if it's progressive or regressive without actually measuring it. So therefore, means test social security on the table. It seems like if we're going to not have a bidirectional topic, you kind of have to bite the bullet somewhat on uh, that you know, means testing problem. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, do you need evidence to characterize these things? Do you need to say it in a plan? I mean, these are all open questions. I mean, I would say no to both personally, but uh, you know, it really depends uh, on context. OK, so um, the other major F our interpretation we have is that it requires taxation. Um, a, few, a lot of people have tried to cut this so far, and I think uh, Bricker's Hicks card is probably still the best one I've seen on this. Um, it says, fiscal redistribution refers to the redistribution of money and income among strata of households by means of both government spending uh, and taxing. Now, the thing I like about this is that it doesn't talk at all about inequality or Gini coefficients. But as soon as we get to this phrase here, progressive income, how are you measuring that? How do you know that that's the effect without looking to an economy-wide basis? Because remember, the very first thing I sh showed you in the second part of the lecture, income inequality is not just like a random comparison between two groups. It's a statement about the distribution of goods and resources in the economy as a whole, of income in this case. It's a reference to the whole economy. And so whenever you see this, I'm pretty sure that they're talking about Gini coefficients. Now, they get really into this. Gini coefficients are actually extremely basic and kind of passe in their world. And so they're like seven steps past the Gini coefficient now. Um, but it's still the most basic and easy to use. And all the others can be converted easily into the Gini coefficient. And so it works as uh, an effective rubric of just the measure of net progressivity. Um, so I still think that this is not even really disagreeing. Now, the reason this is important is because if an F has to include a tax, it at least excludes some Fs. Um, now, most Fs on this topic are going to have to cost money. Some won't. If, if you don't have to progressive, if, if you mean to have social security, you save money. You're saving a lot of money. Uh, and so it's not clear that you need to tax at all because you are decreasing tax revenue. So it excludes those types of Fs. Some Fs will say that they don't want to tax at all. They just want to deficit spend. Um, and so those Fs similarly would have to have a tax that they don't want to defend affixed to them. So if this said that all fiscal redistribution had to have both a tax and a transfer, this would be a very useful card indeed. Uh, and you could already see kind of you know, the argument toolkit being designed around this. We have a taxes pick, an IRS DA. Um, and to be honest, I tried to see it. I'd be fine if this was the topic, but it just doesn't really seem like that to me. Um, I mean, there's a million cards uh, here, but a lot of the same people who say taxes or transfer will uh, say taxes and transfer the next line. Um, and that's kind of because the whole process of taxing and transferring you know, it seems clearly like whenever they say and, they're talking about any tool in the overall tax and transfer toolkit. So, you know, you just casually insert this as a counterinterpretation, which says uh, evaluate the redistributive impact requires a comparison of incomes after taxes and transfers that exist without them. FR can be achieved through direct instruments that tax or provide benefits. And so, there we go. Uh, or we have a counter in play. More importantly, I just you know, don't think any of these cards are saying, like, yeah, to be a real FR policy, you have to do both. I think they're using that term to refer to the entire uh, process. Uh, I mean, the, the term that uh, my guy used, uh, Lindert, was uh, Fisk. And that's the same thing. He just likes that because it's shorter and more jargony. But it's the same thing. And he's, you know, I don't think anyone would say that Fisk has to be uh, both either. Um, and the reason you know this is because these people are not shy about what they think. If they thought that the only policy worth analyzing was like, you know, one that had both a tax and a transfer, they have a line somewhere in the 40 years that were like, no, 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 no. That's not this because it's not a tax and a transfer, which I haven't really seen. Um, now, you can make a few normative claims as well for why this isn't desirable for the topic. Now, again, this is kind of going to speak with the aft side in mind. Um, we'll see how things go. 
Uh, in truth, AFs often figure things out. But the early read on this topic is that it's kind of rough for the F. Um, I mean, the logic here is that, number one, you have to deal with the state's counterplan, which on a domestic topic is never easy. Because the reason why states don't do things in the real world is because no one controls all 50 of them in debate. Fiat, we control all 50 of them, GG. Uh, and so state's counterplan, always a little scary. Um, not only do you have to have a reason the federal government's keep, you also have to defend an extremely controversial policy that makes a major change that the majority of economists and politicians and writers would be against. I mean, subjectively. Maybe not true for Social Security, uh, but certainly for the other two. Um, and that's really the case. Um, there's a couple of arguments that I think uh, Brandon Strass, he loves these. So the lecture tomorrow morning is going to be uh, an extended um, meditation on them. But uh, and means distributive. And so if we increase the set taxes and transfers, we meet by meeting any part of that. And then the other one is that the word by supersedes fiscal redistribution. Where is the word by? Somebody remember? By, yeah. Um, and so when it says by providing, it has defined the word for us. It has said everything outside of that set doesn't matter anymore. And these things necessarily do the thing. There's like a card from like a judge in the 1920s he has that's like, OK, like if a referee in a football game said, you're not allowed to uh, commit a penalty by celebrating the end zone. You can't just be like, oh, well, uh, what if I celebrated this way? He just defined what it was. You're not allowed to do that. Um, he has defined the term for you. So it doesn't matter what the old definition was. There's a new one that has superseded it based on what the word means. Um, to me, these are kind of funny, but uh, not really all that. You know, uh, It's cool. If you had a card about them in the context of the resolution, they'd be really good. Um, but there, luckily, are many cards that um, describe the individual in, uh, impact of here what they call disaggregated measures. So this just like lists out the uh, plan he has for a paper in which he's going to measure the specific redistributive impact of every one of these individual measures from A through I. Some are taxes, some are not. This one actually just analyzes um, the specific Gini coefficients of uh, each of these, and then their share of the country's overall change in inequality. And uh, the Social Security one is actually 54% of all of that country's uh, net change in redistribution. But I mean, clearly, just the fact that they're analyzing these, you know, there's no tax listed there, there's no tax listed there. It's like, you know, analyzing these one at a time clearly is like possible. Um, so that's my take, but we will see. Um, I think, what time is it? Let's take a 10 minute break. does kind of have that problem where like
All right. All right. All right, we have uh, 52 minutes to get through a lot. I think we've gotten the least interesting stuff out of the way. It's kind of onto the, at least for me, the more fun stuff. Um, I guess I could point out quickly that there's a couple of other interpretations uh, that we have cards for. There are cards that fiscal redistribution excludes in kind, and don't like them for the reason I said. There's also cards that say that it excludes taxes, but it's the same thing. Somebody just did a study of transfers only. I mean, you can read them in a one and see. You know, it's maybe like an inch better than T Article 5, but like not by much. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to go through the topic areas. Um, this one will be the most brief because uh, I do think it has the least definitional squabbles. Um, but I do like this one a lot. Uh, we have the job guarantee. Uh, this one is definitely universal. The word guarantee is doing a lot of work here. It guarantees a job to everybody in the United States. Now, there are some older versions that use this uh, sometimes in concert with this term, employer of last resort. There are some older people who use this and they're like, well, we're only going to do it when there's a recession. But for the most part, there's no modern definition that would support that. And I mean, really, this is, again, a small group of people. There are two economics departments out there, one at the Bard College in New England and the other at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And pretty much everybody advocating in like formal academic work um, who actually knows what they're talking about, like who's like citing the right articles and doing math, pretty much every economist working on this has some affiliation with one of those two departments. Um, but for a pretty uh, small band of supporters, um, them and their uh, champion, uh, Randall Ray, uh, they have gotten a lot, a lot of press and popular support for this. Um, so uh, job guarantee is meant to just give everybody a job. Uh, there's maybe like four big justifications for it that I can think of. The first is they think it just solves the recession problem. And what I mean by that is recessions happen inevitably. They happen on average every seven years uh, in any uh, advanced economy. Uh, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, soon enough. They're like, the way recessions get bad, they drag on, uh, spiral out of control, maybe hit depressions, is by people losing their jobs, getting afraid, not spending. Uh, they don't spend, then all the companies that they're going to spend money on, now they have to fire people, and so on it goes in an escalating spiral. Uh, now all these people who were paying taxes aren't paying taxes. That means that there's revenue shortfalls from the government. Now the government can't give out as much stuff, and it all just is this big cyclical problem. Their whole thing is we need to introduce a counter cyclical stabilizer so that when there is a recession, we can just literally hire everybody to work. They'll have a job for free. They don't got to be scared. And we've solved the problem of recessions. They will always have a soft landing and go back to economic stability. Um, the second is mainly just about the value of unemployment. Um, sometimes this is just like a moral thing, which you know definitely is for a lot of people. It sucks not being able to have a job uh, if you don't want one. But it's also wrapped up in this uh, concept called secular stagnation. Um, and this concept basically says, for some reason, uh, productivity growth is extremely slow, and specifically, uh, a term that they call aggregate demand, which is just the sum total of all the things people want, is not increasing in lockstep with growth the way it used to in the past. And so as a result, it's not clear if growth is going to be self-sustaining. We're just kind of locked in this very slow, tepid malaise. Um, this is their big assessment of the economy now, that things are not booming like they should even in uh, up cycles. Um, the third is that, and this is sometimes tied up with this term, public service employment. 
Uh, the third is that you can just build a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I will say with the job guarantee, this one's a little weird to me because there's a little bit of tension here. Um, the whole idea of a job guarantee is you give somebody a terrible job so that they have at least some money and can get by and are encouraged to get back on their feet and go into the private sector. Uh, you don't want to keep them there forever. Uh, otherwise, then you're going to start to compete with the private sector. Um, like some of the times they talk about this, they're like, oh yeah, we're going to have like all these infrastructure people. We're going to train to be like engineers. It's like, wait, wait. Like that sounds like college. You know, a lot of people don't go to work because they go to college instead. If you give them a free program where they get paid to go to college or be an engineer, it seems like they're probably going to do that instead of work. So that is a little bit of tension there. But they can certainly do a bunch of nice stuff. The file that I put out uh, this morning that's in the starter pack, the third advantage is just like an example of the like laundry list uh, grab bag they have. Uh, they love just saying, you know, sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, uh, ocean. Um, aquaculture and stuff like that. Um, I guess I guess it's easy. Uh, and then the fourth, and this one's pretty important as well, is unions and unionization. A lot of people think that a job guarantee would make people care about joining a union and having organized labor have power in the US once again. Um, I didn't write that down, but I felt like probably should um, go through that quickly, because those are the, the major areas that I, I see people advocate these for. There's other stuff too, obviously, you know, kind of solves to an extent inequality, but I'll get to there in a second. But yeah. Um, these terms are all the same. Employer of last resort, that just means I want a job, but I can't find one. You're my employer of last resort. You're my last chance. Um, other versions of this include the Green New Deal, which is often funded by a wealth or a carbon tax. Uh, so the Green New Deal is kind of a slippery term. It was introduced to great popular acclaim earlier this decade. Uh, it often includes decarbonization measures that, based on some of the documents, I don't think you could just like say, yeah, keep it in the ground. We're not allowed to like drill for uh, oil or natural gas anymore, which is like one of the legs of the Green New Deal. I don't really get how that fits into the topic, but maybe I guess I don't know. Call it tax. Um, you know, you're, it's like costs billions of dollars to drill in the ground. I guess, yeah, probably, actually that could work maybe. Um, and then I guess uh, there's also a growth bad version of this. There's especially like one article that if you do searches for job guarantee, it'll like pop up in the first 100 results easily. It's like Hickel or something, and it's called like degrowth job guarantee. Uh, there's not a ton else, but that is a very imaginative article. Um, and this does not like all of the job guarantee advocates from UMKC and BARD because they're trying to save the economy. He's like, oh no, we should actively destroy the economy because we need to have a steady state zero growth economy. But those are the major mechanisms that are out there. I'm sure people will get creative with it, but I don't really think there's amazing evidence for it on, you know, forget T, just at a substantive level as well. Um, now, here is my calculus when determining how to fund your job guarantee F. I define deficit spending for you. Uh, this was in a few questions, and we're going to have a lot on this uh, coming up. But uh, deficit spending just refers to spending money you don't have. When you're the federal government, this is your normal state of affairs. Most annual budgets have less money in the revenue side and more money in the expenditure side. Why does it happen? Because when we deficit spend, we typically sell a treasury bond, which a bond is just it's like a stock. It says, here's a dollar. I'm going to pay you this dollar back with interest in the future. The US is the uh, most lucrative bond salesman in the world. Uh, we have the highest you know, hit rate. Uh, we have the highest credit. The dollar is the core currency in every bank around the world, and so people want dollars. Uh, so people will always give us, even after many, many, many trillions of uh, dollars ran in deficits. And as a result, we just like not tax. Just, it's not even like you deficit spend. It's like we you know, allocate it, we pay for it, the end. I like this because a big fear of mine on this topic is the state's counter plan. Um, it's, doesn't really exist because in the literature, the federal government runs Social Security. The 
BIG and job guarantees are you know, so expensive that it seems ludicrous to imagine that states which literally prohibit balanced, uh, non-balanced budgets, they prohibit them from deficit spending. Uh, but the NAC has fiat. And so the NAC can say, OK, states, all of you are changing your constitutions. You are now allowed to deficit spend. You are going to do the same thing the federal government does. You're going to borrow money. It's not quite as easy. You can't just sell um, a treasury bond, but you can sell any other financial instrument. Um, you know, your states have banks, and they already borrow lots of money, and a lot of them uh, violate their uh, balanced budget requirements with glee as it is. And you could just raise revenue through all sorts of taxes and other things, which is also why I don't love taxes as a funding mechanism, because if you deficit spend and they say taxes, you could at least say tax is bad. But if you have a tax and you're like, that tax is good, it's kind of hard to be like, oh, well, the state doing the tax is way, way worse. Because uh, you know, it's, and maybe there's something. But a well-designed counter plan to me seems like it can kind of solve that. So I sort of think the state's counter plan is OP. Um, there are not that many advocates for this stuff, but there is enough. And again, like a lot of this topic, we're, we're dealing on the speculative edges of policy here. Uh, and so I am worried about this. But this deficit spending gap still has an answer, which is that the states doing this would be very difficult and bad for the economy. It would be bad for the economy because it would demonstrate uh, basically mass fiscal irresponsibility and distrust on the part of the states. And it would be very, very difficult because these things are extremely expensive and the states are already in financial shambles. They're actually not, but the week before I put this together, an article uh, by a guy who basically studies this for a living came out and he's like, oh, it turns out the uh, compromise that we had for the uh, debt ceiling really ended all of the reasons why states have lots of money now. They've been getting a lot of free COVID aid from the government. That's all gone. They're all about to be broke, uh, which is going to hurt state ser services. And so you at least have a set of answers with this. It's kind of hard to make states into major players who can just like fiat into existence hundreds of, millions, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, but with taxes, when you yourself are like, oh yeah, I fiat into existence billions of dollars, it's a lot easier for states to be like, same. But there is a big reason why this is very dangerous. And that is because this is not exactly the greatest time to be deficit spending. Um, now, you will have noticed that the first advantage I gave to the job guarantee was like, a job guarantee is great because it prevents recessions. For the most part right now, we're worried about inflation. We're so worried about inflation that we might go into a recession on purpose to avoid it. Uh, we'll talk all or more about this uh, extensively in the future if you're a little confused in this. But the basics is we are worried that money is circulating around so much that there's so much of it that it doesn't mean quite as much. It's worth a little bit less than it was previously. And all of a sudden, our salaries, because our money is worth a little bit less, cannot afford the same stuff uh, we used to on the same salary we have now. That is a very, very toxic uh, spiral for an economy to get knocked into. And the Federal Reserve, which is functionally independent from uh, the government, uh, tries to counteract that by setting interest rates that make it very hard to freely spend and proliferate money. Uh, I will say with this F, your best bets are recession now slash inevitable, especially kind of the cyclical way. We solve the impact to recession. And there is a case I think you can make that the impact of the F would just be to um, change the Federal Reserve mission formally. There's actually a card that says it by uh, a Nobel laureate, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, although he's a normal laureate, kind of goes off the deep end. Um, and he's like, kind of just ranting about the Fed and how they are unconstitutional and doing all these things he hates. And he's like, well, sure, they passed like a crazy interest rate hike in response to a job guarantee. But like, you know, if you're going to think about that, why even advocate for cool things to begin with? And so it, you could actually read that card as being like, well, OK, if we're fiatting the federal government implements a job guarantee with good faith, clearly, they would take the onus of preventing uh, unemployment away from the Fed, uh, and they would basically hamstring their ability to uh, overreact, basically overturn the Fed. Um, but 
you know, there's other answers to, you know, the, MM, the, the advocates of this really think there's some good ways to spin a plan that's non-inflationary. Maybe. They're, they're definitely heterodox. Um, but that's kind of the decision calculus we have here. Like I said, being half on this topic, it's going to be about uh, picking your poison. Okay, I've ran a about that enough. Um, we're going to go to basic income. Um, this one I like because there are two debates, and they're actually kind of interesting ones. Um, basic income, to me, uh, this is the best general purpose definition. It's now without its flaws, and there's actually some very good answers to it. Um, there's a couple that uh, David Haidt found that I included um, in the AF section. But I like it because he sets up a, like, first of all, this article has like 12 pages on what is a definition? How do we know when to believe a definition and stuff like that? And so he's like really trying to figure out, like, he has more intent to define than you can imagine. And he basically is merging. Uh, in his words, the two definitions of the biggest different basic income advocacy groups in his country, England, unfortunately for us, not the US, but still. And he's like, OK, well, here are the five things that the Citizens Basic Income Trust and the period and the um, Basic Income Earth Network have in common. Uh, they are periodic. So they're paid like every month or every two weeks. They're not just given off once. They are cash payments, which, you know, nice, not in kind. Uh, they are individual. So this is actually sneaky because a lot of the things that people are going to want to call basic income go through taxes in the US. And taxes are distributed through households for the most part. And so uh, this is arguably something that excludes taxes. It's universal, so no means testing. And it is unconditional, which means to everybody. It's, there's actually another card that defines it is unconditional only in the context that you don't have to work for it. But if there are other meanings of unconditional, it does not mean those. And so it's not quite like the consult competition card, you might think. But um, this is the general uh, setup here. I'll go back to that in a second with what that excludes and maybe another way out. But the other big T definition is maybe a basic income has to be sufficient. So sufficient here is that an individual has enough money to live on. The US, I mean, I don't know if you remember what the poverty line numbers were. They're pretty small. It'd be really hard to live on that and like you know afford rent anywhere. Um, but at least that and probably more. But that's important because a lot of the potential apps people would read as basic incomes are much less. Uh, the carbon dividend idea is basically a carbon tax. So a carbon tax is a tax on any good or service that uses carbon. It attempts to approximate how much carbon volume you've emitted into the atmosphere and charges you accordingly for it. Uh, a carbon uh, dividend would take the proceeds of that tax and just distribute them progressively throughout the country as a carbon dividend. Uh, and that's the idea. A land dividend is something similar. It's a land tax, which redistributes from the landowning class to the non-landowning class. It seems like it's a bigger deal in Britain, uh, a lot more public land in the US. Uh, Andrew Yang's freedom dividend, which is actually very small in its cash benefit, would also fall under this label as well. I included two cards here. Uh, the Hefe card is pretty good. It cites a few sources, but it's not as authoritative. Tory is from the UK, but he's like, well, I just don't agree on this. So this actually seems like an open question that a lot of times I feel like if definitions are relatively equally predictable, that's where just whoever can win, it's better for the topic, uh, would win. Um, now, there are a number of basic income-like things that are number one. If they're not topical, they're all very good counter plans against basic income and job guarantee. And number two, they're all uh, pretty easy to exclude through this definition. Um, I didn't go into the F cards. They're, they're in the file. Um, Social Security is a bit as well. And you know I, I've been stressed. i got to get out of here by 12.30. So I'm not going to go into uh, the F cards there. I, I think the NAG one's a little bit better. But there's a debate to be had there for sure. Uh, and these Fs are all very attractive because they're going to avoid a lot of the design flaws that people hone in on for basic income. Uh, a negative income tax is the intellectual forefather of the basic income. 
It's actually uh, designed by the famed monetarist economist Milton Friedman. Um, and this is somebody who hates the idea of ever giving anything to poor people. So it was kind of in this resigned way of, well, OK, if we had to do anything resembling spending on the poor, here's what we do. Uh, and the way it would work is you distribute it through an income tax that uh, is set to negative rates uh, for a certain percentage. So like, let's say that, uh, again, poverty lines 14.5. Uh, let's say that, as a result, uh, the UBI is just going to distribute the poverty line across the country $1,200 a month. So a negative income tax would say every dollar you earn is going to be a fraction off of that tax. So if you didn't earn anything and you got $1,200 a year, how much would you uh, get back in taxes? $1,200. Very simple. Now, he has a trick here. It's designed such that for every uh, dollar you earn, again, like if you made $1, you're supposed to get back $11.99, you actually only lose 50 cents. So it encourages you to start making more and more money because you don't lose that from the tax. Because like, let's say you don't have a way to make 1200 a year. Why bother making 800? You're just going to lose it all, right? Um, because you know, it's, you're going to get 1200 no matter what. And so if you had to get a dollar off of that negative income tax, you'd end up just keeping uh, 400 from negative income tax and paying 100 in tax. So he's like, for every dollar, we'll basically give you 50 cents back, which gives you an incentive to keep earning uh, and basically sets up like a, a idealized best fit line of economic efficiency. Um, so economists really like this. Apparently, there's something elegant about his math. Like this comes up again and again and again. Um, there's like some uh, equation or proof that he gets to that was just like very aesthetically or intellectually pleasing. Um, but uh, it does seem like quite a mess. And so the basic income is like, well, if we give people $1,200 a year, we might as well just you know give it to them, and then they can do whatever they want to afterwards. Um, a similar, uh, and this is probably one of the more discussed social programs in the US. A uh, similar program is the Earned Income Tax Credit. This is actually inspired by the negative income tax, which never existed. The Earned Income Tax Credit is actually the largest poverty alleviation uh, program for children, uh, families of children. Uh, it does not give a lot of money, and it does not give uh, money to a wide range of people. It typically tends to find people who are right under the poverty line and give them enough money to get right over the poverty line. But exactly what in what year is so confusing that like 40 to 60% of people who are eligible for it don't get it. And it also has, as a percentage of its overall uh, expenditures, the highest administrative cost of any program. Some people really love to make fun of social uh, of SSI, the organization that runs Social Security. If you like Google social uh, SSI incompetent, you'll like have a field day. And uh, the EITC is uh, l about 22 times more inefficient than them. And that's mainly because of its bizarre structure. So nonetheless, a lot of people really see potential in this. And there's a lot of ideas to reform or expand it. There's actually a Lex article called EITC for All that has the idea of making the EITC into like a formal basic income. But again, I think it's excluded from the previous definition. You will certainly see this as a counter plan, and some people try it. The last thing is that um, the original thing I said about basic income, that the original idea was we'll just get rid of all of the other programs uh, so we can save money on those and just give people basic income. This was not abandoned. It's still a popular concept. There's actually pretty good cards being like basic income is distinct from this idea, which is usually called. I don't actually understand why, but it's just kind of how it evolved. A basic income guarantee, or a minimum income guarantee, or guaranteed income, or some permutation thereof. Basic income is usually assumed to be the same as UBI, or universal basic income, at least according to Tory in his analysis. Um, it's not an intuitive grammatical read, but it does seem to be a reasonable reflection of how it's used. But uh, 
even if it is basic income, I don't think it's fiscal redistribution. There's actually a part of Tory where he literally says, yeah, if you just means test it, if you get rid of all means tested benefits, it's like get rid of all of them, no food stamps, no welfare, none of that, only basic income, uh, this would clearly be increasing inequality such that it imposes costs on low income households, which is a, just a direct violation that it is a regressive fiscal measure as opposed to a progressive one. So I actually think this might be more promising T violation than this, mainly just because I don't feel like there's a very strong answer to um, the, the redistribution one, at least as far as I could see. But again, people will try to do this. I mean, the disads on this topic are good. And the neg cards, there's just a lot more of them. And they tend to represent a more consensus viewpoint. And so I think apps are going to want to lean into link turning and dodging when they can. Uh, yeah, I always have time for this. Um, so this is just really funny to me. Uh, it's like the greatest neg framework card ever. Uh, it's by the late David Graeber, uh, legendary anthropologist. And this card is like literally the things people say in K-debates that you never have cards for. Like there's a mental trip we play on ourselves. What do we do about X? Unless we happen to be part of that 3 to 5% whose views actually affect policymakers. I find such games pernicious because I prefer not to have policy elites around at all. I prefer solutions to immediate problems that do not give more power to governments or corporations. I look to a movement already out there. But what would people do about bullshit jobs, which is a book he wrote about how a huge percent of uh, contemporary workers, especially white collar workers, literally feel like what they do is meaningless. That is why I can get behind basic income. Basic income might seem like it's state power, but it's the reverse. Uh, so it's just like the best bait and switch for, uh, you know, only this half avoids the K. Um, all right, social security. Um, Social security is its own world. Uh, I'm a little bit, I wish we did a social security F, um, just because I feel like this is the area of the topic that has the most uncertainty attached to it um, and the most variance potentially. Now, the Social Security Act from 1935 was just about old people dependent and uh, it granted uh, like reimbursement for some medical care. Uh, 26 years later, it passes an amendment that establishes Medicare, which basically gives free health insurance to people over 65. Uh, in 1972, it added another supplemental security income program. Now, I want to just go over uh, what we call in the file, this is not a term we made up, that's what they call it. Uh, OAD, uh, OADSI, OSDI uh, sometimes. Old people, dependents, and disabled people are like the core group of social security. Um, you'll have a whole lecture on it, but uh, social security hits when you're uh, 67, but you can get it early if you take a little bit less benefit per year if you're 62, and you can actually defer it if you're still working, making money, uh, to when you're 70, and then you make more, uh, you make 124% uh, if you wait till then. So you can kind of start getting it every year. It basically functions the same way as a basic income, get a bunch of money handed to you. Um, dependents, uh, it's not just these three categories, uh, although these are the three biggest ones, uh, and they are representative. These are people who basically were depending on somebody who they can no longer depend on. You're older than 60 and your spouse died. Uh, your, uh, I should have added, uh, unmarried children, 18 or younger, whose parents died, um, disabled, uh, or, oh yeah, disabled children, unmarried, I guess I, I disabled children who are unmarried, 18 or younger as well, um, and then, uh, disability is separate as well. Uh, some people say disability for social security is just extremely arduous, like they have their own process. Uh, people disagree with the psychiatry behind it for like mental health evaluations. That in and of itself, I think could be a topical ask as I understand it as well. So there's just a lot of room to do so much, even in this little slice. And I haven't even gotten to the funding. Uh, now, 
I do think the best definition, and this is actually, some people think it's open and shut. It's not. There's cards. Um, but uh, we have, like, uh, this isn't even one of the better ones. And we have, like, I think 20 of them already in the starter pack that are just quotes from either judge decisions or US code that says the same thing. For the most part, in the US, we just use Social Security to provide old age survivor disability insurance benefits. That's it. Um, it used to be used in a broader sense. Medicare is no longer administered by the Social Security Administration. Now, I'll get to this in a second and have it on a slide. Medicare does have some involvement. They basically enroll people and establish uh, eligibility. Your SI establishes eligibility for Medicare. So when you get your health insurance, the first person you talk to is SSA. But afterwards, Medicare is located within the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's not really part of it anymore. And our usage, at least according to uh, the Legal Information Institute, uh, which attempts to aggregate definitions from legal sources, uh, no longer reflects that. And there's a bunch of contextual stuff there as well. And the real kicker here is that, OK, like if it was just Medicare, that's one thing. A lot of people think about this as like, oh, Medicare, you can do single payer. And while that's true, and while single payer is like by itself maybe 25 different apps that sustained an entire and one of the better high school topics, no, it is not just single payer. Medicare has four different parts. There's been a bunch of proposals for others. Uh, other parts do things like you know, Part D's prescription drugs um, and stuff like that. They all have slightly different functions as they wanted to add different health services to streamline it. You could literally do it any fix to Medicare that broadens the distribution, which like, I mean, if you went through the first 100 articles, you have 75 Fs of just like search Medicare expand reform proposal. And so even if it's close on the merits, the limits case here, you basically have to win the resolution is unsalvageable garbage for the F elsewhere, which that's not my impression initially. Um, I don't think it's easy, but I wouldn't say it's that hard yet. Uh, but maybe it'll get there. Like, honestly, if the AF was as bad as it was at, by the TOC for the AF last year, maybe that would be a position where you'd accept something like the Medicare counterinterpretation. Um, at least that was my impression. Um, so a uh, little bit more on how uh, Medicare uh, works, just because, again, people are going to really try to push this and uh, be pedantic about it. Uh, Medicare is basically used for determining initial eligibility. It processes premium payments, and they're involved in the Part D prescription drug program. That's pretty much it. And they have no involvement in Medicaid. The one thing that there is actual disputes on, like the cards are basically even, a lot of people say Social Security excludes SSI, and a lot of people say it doesn't. And Social Security Administration does administer SSI. And SSI is also basically the same thing as Social Security, just like more of it. Like it just like gives more additional benefits to uh, people who really need it. So that's a possible F. Now, like I said, uh, Social Security is financed through a famously regressive tax. It's not the only funding source. It's actually kind of cool. All the funding sources that go together in this uh, sort of magical bin called the Trust Fund. Um, and there is quite a dispute over the exact contributions of what to the trust fund. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer in the sense that, like, you know, if the trust fund was light, the government wouldn't be like, oh, well, sorry, uh, you can just, like, starve. We're not going to give you Social Security out. But they do try to keep it solvent. Uh, and as they also publish all of their data, which means that there is more literature going back farther on, is Social Security going bu uh, bust? Is it sustainable? Than this on than almost any other deficit issue. And again, this is 25% of our GDP, 20, 23, 25. So this is a huge, huge program, which is also why people worry about it so much. Um, there are other potential definitions that I included quite a bit of. And some of them, if you look at the card by itself, it looks pretty good for like it includes welfare or TANF. But like again, the limits case for for what you have to do to ex expand is just so, so rough that I don't really see it being very credible. 
Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the setup for the social security debate. Um, the core problems we have with social security do tend to relate to its financing. Uh, the baby boomer generation, everybody's favorites, are retiring, 75 million of them in the coming years. Uh, they are a huge swath that are going to be replaced by a generation that has less money and has fewer numbers. The number of retirees collecting benefits in 20 years is expected to increase 60% from the current baseline. The number of workers paying tax to support that 14%. Uh, that is not ideal, um, to say the least. SSA's uh, estimated contribution to Social Security will by then be only three quarters of the current benefits given to retirees because we won't be able to keep up with inflation. Separately, we have another huge debate in the Social Security lid. I have curiosity, who here has done like pre-institute Social security research, like on like the big controversy here, uh, Medicaid and like so and single payer doesn't count, like like actuals. Yeah, a few of you. Okay, um, so this is one of the things that you see a lot. And to be totally honest, I'm like actually not really convinced on either side myself yet. It seems very hard to assess um, because people often use polls that are not very verifiable for these. And also, like, lots of things can happen throughout life, like getting married or getting a new job that totally changes your situation. But there's a huge take out there that the next generation of retirees, unlike all previous ones, has planned very poorly. Their retirement savings accounts, if they even exist, have already been raided. Uh, and so they're not going to be able to afford to retire. And so we're going to have basically, they're going to qualify for every uh, benefit that they can, which you know, is a lot of money. But even that might not be able to keep them like uh, paying for housing and food and stuff like that. And so we have to counterbalance the retirement crisis alongside the payment uh, for Social Security. Now, unsurprisingly, the people who typically say a retirement crisis is coming are those who are like, we should expand Social Security. We obviously need to give more benefits out to help them. And usually when we expand Social Security, it could mean expand the age out, but usually doesn't. Um, usually, it's either straight up like a very complicated set of we expand these benefits for these years for these incomes in tandem, but they do so in a more progressive way, more benefits. Um, you know, no, and no one's like only do it for more rich people, so you know it's fairly progressive for the most part. Uh, one progressive thing that maybe scares me, I think you could probably just get rid of the tax cap and be like, people who have to get taxed on all of their uh, income for the payroll uh, past 160000 And that would be a pretty uncontroversial idea that would help out funding and be more progressive. Advantages aren't huge, but the DAs are basically non-existent. Because um, remember, the flip side of tax and transfer, if you don't have to be a, tax, uh, you also don't have to be a transfer. You could just be a tax uh, or even getting rid of tax. Um, but there are a lot of proposals that don't even count as like a basic expand benefits thing. And other than like kind of a finicky definition of expand, like expand means certain, expand means create new or alternatively expand means increase from pre-existing baseline. I really haven't found evidence, and I've talked to quite a few people, uh, everyone's kind of come up empty on excluding really so many of the core pro uh, proposals out there. So a big one, and this is kind of similar to two-tier, is IRAs. People want to link their independent retirement accounts with Social Security, such that they're putting a lot of money from their salary into a retirement account. Uh, and they can basically get that money with their Social Security benefit and get rewarded for saving extra. And so it's basically like an incentive system and a reward system for saving in a retirement account. Uh, some people are especially like, we need to do this in order to encourage people to save so that they don't fall victim to the retirement crisis. Uh, the most controversial set of things you know, is privatization of Social Security, which 
again, can mean a lot of things. And parts of it are arguably already somewhat privatized. Uh, you know, any money that's kept in a bank is somewhat privatized because banks are private entity that could technically go put any moment. But privatization here typically refers to putting money in investment accounts that would be linked to uh, mutual funds or other private wealth uh, generators in order to both incentivize you think your money is being saved or spent well, but also potentially uh, increase benefits across the board if this is like a more effective way to uh, allocate and save money. So instead of putting all of your social security tax just in the trust fund, which you know basically just paying taxes, you get to put it in a private fund that then pays dividend to you. Uh, the other huge proposal that would be confusing to evaluate, it was confusing then, is something that was a big proposal of George W. Bush called progressive indexing. And I actually think this is a likely AF thing, because what this is is like we're going to pick five different things. We're going to expand this set of Social Security recipients' uh, eligibility or their uh, benefits by this much. But we're going to decrease taxes on this set by this much. And some of them might be regressive, and some of them might be progressive, but the net effect has to be progressive. And so George tried to sell this as like a social security reform plan to the American public. He was probably even more confusing pitching it than I am describing it to you right now, which did not go over very well. Uh, but as kind of like a wonky way to produce very specific advantage <laughs> outcomes alongside you know, just barely edging on the phrase of being topical on the progressive side of things, I could see lots of you know, ways of doing this. And um, people love proposing new progressive indexing ideas along with the times. Two tier again, we just set up two different tracks for Social Security based on who's investing what. Uh, and the other big one is means testing, which I mentioned, if AFs don't have to be progressive, you could be like, right now, Social Security is a, mean, a universal benefit. You get it even if you're, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos, um, they could be like, no, over a certain income, you're cut off, no social security for you, we will means test it. And that, first of all, you could argue that means testing is progressive, straight up. Um, there are some people who are like means testing by definition basically causes the poorest to slip through the cracks, it's like a difficult system to work through, and so means testing, um, we have to like assume like really, really uh, rough mathematical, uh, you know, we have to attach rough mathematical baggage that makes it very hard to come out as progressive, uh, progressive in a formula. But like, if it was literally like set it as an income, we don't give social security to anybody with like an income of a million dollars or, or more, that's progressive. But usually with mean testing here, it would be like a comprehensive conservative plan to actually solve the social security problem. Because the big thing that's going to make these apps annoying is like Social Security is 25% of our GDP, yeah, but these apps are going to change 2%, 3% of that 25%. And so means testing might be a way to just cut out the Social Security transfers that we really don't want to begin with and get us in the path to fiscal solvency. So means testing, you know, that's definitely going to be an attractive one, and it goes the opposite direction in terms of links to inflation and stuff like that. And then uh, the last thing I will cover is a little bit more on the health issue. Um, so I don't know if these are the best cards, but these are two representative ones. This one would have been better if it was like, uh, if I could find the Black's Law one. For some reason, I. so there's like different second editions. I need to find the physical one here at the library now that I'm back on Central Campus and see if I can find the second edition one decided as Black's Law, uh, as opposed to a no-date uh, lawdictionary.com. But assuming that's accurate, you know, seems pretty nice, Use health insurance. Uh, this uh, also seems pretty nice. It's from 1965. But if you look who it's uh, citing, it's describing a book by the chief actuary of the Social Security Administration, where he extensively discuss the concept how to define Social Security, which compared to a lot of the cards out there will have, I think, a clearer intent to define from a more authoritative source. Social Security is meaningless when considered in the broad sense. Great for us. 
usually you think that's about to be a neg card, but here it's like, no, 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 we're getting rid of all the other stuff. But it only means cash payments uh, to you know, those whose income ceased to diminish, so OSCI. Medical care for those receiving benefits under item one. So again, uh, OSDI and Medicare actually meets that because again, Medicare only goes to old people who qualify for Social Security. And number three, cash payments to all children in a given category, which doesn't describe any contemporary benefit program as I understand them. So it's like, it's literally just Medicare and from an authoritative source. But it is from 1965. And if you remember the other problem, uh, the other thing that that uh, initial interim card I had, it was like Social Security used to mean this, but it changed, especially once it migrated away from being run by CMM. And try as I may, because I did, I tried to, like, I, I love kind of trolling people with crazy AF interpretations of T things. Like, if I could have found it, I, I would have definitely probably tried to make it happen, but I just don't really think it's there. Uh, a few more just kind of neg ones, and then one more F one. This one is like uh, a clean kill. So I actually thought the Gonzaga T file was great, and I stole quite a few cards from uh, Trifonov, but one of the mistakes I think was most of the Social Security work used Social Security lowercase. Social Security lowercase refers uh, literally to um, other systems. This isn't the best card. It, they're fine for it. Like they describe it. There's like five cards we have for this, though, that kind of make it clear. The US system is called Social Security Two Capitals. It's a noun describing a specific uh, process with its own administrative agency. And around the world, people love just calling Social Security, uh, calling any old thing Social Security, pensions, healthcare, whatever. That's how Europeans do it. I mean, they love their welfare programs. Um, so I think if you have a counterinterp that has lowercase social security, it's not pulled out. Uh, and then one more here. Uh, this is from 89, which is actually 20, or uh, not 20. It's like 17 years after Medicare left, uh, left SSA. And so if you wanted maybe an half answer to that, you could be like, look, 20 years after social security abandoned Medicare, let it go out on its own, it still was associated. And there's a very intuitive reason why they're associated. It's because you get both of them when you're 65 or thereabouts. They're a free universal entitlement that gives you health care and a cash income, which is a setup for retirement. So it's like kind of obvious. And then they're literally created by the same act. And the SSA is still involved somewhat in both of them. So like there is a case. And if Medicare reform was smaller, or there was a word more limiting than expand, I would think this is viable. If someone finds a counterinterpret of expand, that could be the next kind of game changer on how people interpret or evaluate this. But um, we actually got through it, and I only skipped about five of the graphs, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, we, do you have five minutes? But if you have a question, I'm just going to ask you to come and see me and let everybody go to lunch if they want to. Uh, welcome to Michigan. Hope you have a great time this summer.